Welcome to the Spine Talk podcast. My name is Richard Geyer. Hi, I'm Scott Blumenthal. Hi, I'm Jessica Shellock. Today we're going to talk about the history of disc replacement. And what I'd like to do is uh, let's talk about when disc replacement first came about. Well, um, disc replacement first came about outside of the U.S. back in the 80s, but we started looking into it experimentally and via some research back in the 90s, and we started doing disc replacement surgery, gosh, it's been 23 years now. So we started in March of 2000, uh, and since that time, um, it's, we've only learned more, we've only done more, uh, and we have a lot more choices in how to treat patients now. So 23 years at TBI. And, and what exactly is it? So a disc replacement is when the native disc is removed surgically and in the space where the disc once was we insert a device that is allowing the spine to maintain movement everyone has heard of spinal fusion and many people understand that that means that motion is taken away from a spinal segment so the disc replacement or disc arthroplasty involves putting in a device generally made of metal and plastic um, and that device allows for spinal movement to continue, thereby not taking away the natural motion at that disc segment from the surgery. If I can add something too, if that's sure. okay. Um, it, it, we do this in the neck, cervical spine, and the low back lumbar. And it, the, the concept is not new because in the old, old days, orthopedic surgeons used to fuse hip joints and knee joints for arthritis. And now, it's absolutely unquestionably the standard that the replacements of those joints are something that we've all known people that have had one or more uh, and it was a natural evolution in the spine to move from fusion to motion joint the joints were frankly meant to move so that makes sense to all of us but why do you think that there's still so many fusions that are being done well n number one it's there is a learning curve and some surgeons are less willing to, to kind of get out of their comfort zone because we were all trained in fusions, those of us that have been doing this for a while. You know, and, and frankly, you know, the, to be brutally honest, um, the economics. Uh, fusions are more lucrative than disc replacements are. So we did the first disc replacement 23 years ago in March of 2000. How many have we done so far? I think that our numbers, the most recent numbers, um, total over 5,000 patients who have been implanted with artificial discs, um, and that included over 6,000 implants for those patients. So we have a vast experience uh, amongst the surgeons here doing disc replacement. So it, it is interesting with respect to cervical disc replacement, which seems to be much more widely accepted and being carried out compared to lumbar. Why do you think that is? Diagnosis. So the, the problem, the symptoms that we use cervical disc replacement on um, are, it's a diagnosis that every surgeon treats. We're all trained in it, again, classically with non-motion options, but now with motion. Lumbar spine is, is, is a different issue. It's, it's basically an arthritic painful joint that causes back pain without neurologic issues, and uh, some surgeons elect not to treat that. I think that to add to that, um, it's also a familiar approach to get to the cervical spine, and everyone feels more comfortable, I think, with that, versus in the lumbar spine, we do partner with access surgeons who help to safely get us there. Why do you think it is that we see patients that say, that the surgeon never even discussed with them the possibility of doing a lumbar disc replacement, like it's been a brand new thing. We've been doing it for 23 years. Well, you know, it's, it's really two answers. Uh, I think in the, in the lumbar spine, low back, disc replacement has become more of a center of excellence concept. There, there are just places around the U.S., fortunately, we hear at TBI, um, where patients come from all over the country. In the cervical spine, neck, Again, I think it comes down to economics. Um, it, it's it, There's much less reimbursement for arthroplasty or disc replacement uh, than there is for fusion. And I also think that the technical aspect of doing this type of surgery well is something that 
um, really requires a lot of cases to you know get the good experience, especially with the lumbar spine. Um, it's not forgiving like a spinal fusion is. Um, the implants have to be placed almost perfectly, and it requires extra work and time. And um, as Scott pointed out, sometimes with the economics, that doesn't weigh in for everybody that it's worth doing so. Um, so I think that you know we've become a center of excellence and with our experience and, and our knowledge of the, the science and the studies behind it, I think that we've just been able to really you know, get um, a, a lot of great experience and, and have very happy patients that have been benefited. And another thing, if, if I can add, is that we still do fusions when it's appropriate, both in the neck and the low back. And we found that about 20% of the time in the, in the neck and about 40% of the time in the low back, that's the better operation. But turn that around and it's 60% of the time patients are candidates for the lumbar disc replacement and a whopping 80% of patients probably should have a disc replacement in the neck, not a fusion. So that segues into another question in terms of how we've evolved in terms of our patient selection to get the very good results that we see with lumbar disc replacement. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's a great point. Um, I think how we've evolved is, as you mentioned earlier, it's by our experience of five to 6,000 repetitions and learning. Um, most people don't know that the original FDA trials um, include a very narrow group of patients. And most patients that you see in real world don't fit into that very narrow group. They have problems that are slightly beyond the original problems. And the reality is, is when you first start learning a technique, you kind of stick to the sweet spot. But as you learn how to apply this to a general or a more general population, you're going to find that the technology is applicable to more than just would have fit into an FDA study 23 years ago. And that also segues into another question. While cervical disc replacement is being widely accepted, and lumbar is slowly gaining ground, even though it's been around longer. Tell us about the insurance um, paying for these, because we're talking about this wonderful technology, but not all patients can get it. Well, as you, as you mentioned, the um, cervical disc replacements have really gained pretty widespread coverage for one and two levels. Um, in fact, most carriers will cover cervical uh, surgery for disc replacement. It's really the lumbar that has fallen behind. And interestingly, as you pointed out, the lumbar has been around for longer than the cervical. So I, I, don't, um, I don't understand, honestly, why it took so long for some of the carriers to approve a technology that we have some of the best science behind with the FDA IDE studies, and yet they were still slow to come around. Um, many of the carriers now will approve one level, and we've made some ground with coverage for two level with many carriers, but there's still, there's still a ways to go with um, even such as Blue Cross Federal. Um, some of these plans that, you know, are, uh, you know, taking care of many of our, um, our veterans and um, people that work for the government are still being denied this type of procedure despite 23 years of, of data showing uh, the benefits of it. So what do you do with the young patient that's a great candidate for disc replacement? The insurance company says, no, we're not going to approve it. Should we tell, tell them to have a fusion or tell them to wait it out or to ask grandpa if they'll help them out? Well, if, if they have a, a federal funded plan, they can call their congressperson. Um, the reality is the patient demand is there, and that's what's really driving particularly lumbar at this point. Um, so as, as Jessica said, the reimbursement environment is a bit slower for lumbar, but patient demand is, is pushing not only the, the reimbursers, you know, they, they are looking for alternatives, which is why we see patients from all over the country. And, you know, we had discussed this before in terms of uh, the patients that are candidates for disc replacement. but. It used to be philosophically that many surgeons would say that, well, there's too many disqualifiers, a little bit of degenerative facet disease, and you touched on it earlier. What is your take on 
the percentages of patients now that are candidates for disc replacement versus those that should have a fusion well, that we see? Good question. I, you know, I think that percentage-wise, um, you know, the vast majority of patients would be a candidate for arthroplasty, for disc replacement. And, and you know, my personal philosophy, and I think that um, it's the same for many of us with our Center for Disc Replacement, is that I'm trying to find a reason why the patient is not a candidate for arthroplasty. Bingo. That's what I wanted to get out. So we try exactly. to find a reason why they're not a candidate for disc replacement, which exactly. is totally opposite what the general spine surgeon does out there. But we still off, we still do the fusions when they're appropriate. Of course, appropriate. When, when it's appropriate. Absolutely. But that goes back to selection, and that's why we have such good results. And um, you know, we just looked at our first 1,800, and our revision rate was only 1.5% of the lumbar disc replacements. 1.5%, and that was at a two to 20 year follow-up. Total hips, they say, is really the gold standard for, disc, uh, for arthroplasty, and they're 5% at 10 years. We're 1.5% at 22 years. Pretty strong. Great. So who would be the ideal candidate for a disc replacement in the cervical and the lumbar, and you can each take one? So I'll go with the cervical. Um, the, the patients that come into our office with usually a combination of neck pain but arm pain as well um, may be a candidate for arthroplasty. In fact, I would say that the majority of cases that um, we see that are surgical, uh, that are patients in need of surgery for the neck, really ought to be considered for, um, for disc replacement. It's the you know, patients that even have spinal cord compression, spinal nerve compression at one or two levels that have some degenerative changes of their discs without severe bridging bone or uh, severe degenerative changes of their facet joints. Um, these, are, these are candidates that do great with reconstruction and maintaining motion. So in, in, in the lumbar spine, obviously the benefits would be uh, to reduce or eliminate the pain and preserve the motion. So it's the only technology that can do both. Um, what patients are the, are the, are the best? Um, it's the ones that have been told by another doctor that, hey, you need a fusion uh, for your back pain. And you know, a certain percentage, in fact, more than 50% will be candidates for motion preservation. So you get the, the pain relief result that you want and you preserve the motion that we've found in long-term studies has the benefit of decreasing the chance of needing more surgery in the future compared to fusion. Well, what are the general numbers that... I, I tell patients, in, in, well, actually frankly for both the neck and the back, is that they've got probably a third to a fourth less of a chance of needing another operation in their neck or back compared to fusion. Okay, let's look at the flip side. So what are the absolute line in the sand that you wouldn't do an arthroplasty in either the neck or the back? That's a, that's a good question, and I think that that's something that you know, the general population and, and our patients need to also understand. Um, but the, you know, some of the absolute no-goes are um, active infection or malignancy, i.e., you know, cancer, an active infection at the level to be treated, um, really poor bone quality, um, so either osteoporosis in the neck or osteopenia, which is kind of between the normal and osteoporosis in the lumbar spine and the low back, that would be a contraindication. Um, severe degenerative changes of the facet joints. These are the joints that are paired structures in the back part of the spinal canal that will continue to move even though we replace the disc. If those are extremely diseased, those are gonna be a continued source of pain and the outcome won't be um, optimal for the patient. Um, and then additionally, if there are in the lumbar spine, if there are uh, patients that have had a lot of previous surgery uh, in their abdomen, um, then they may not be a candidate for a safe surgical approach to get to the front of the spine um, through, the, through the belly, basically. And that would be a, a complete no-go. Well, and I, and, I, and I hate to even be um, more general because you know, I know the audience. Unfortunately, age is an issue. You can't really safely or effectively do artificial disc surgery 
in the lumbar spine really past 60 or 65, and in the cervical, you know, maybe past 70. Um, the other thing that we see really commonly in an elderly low back pain patient is scoliosis, and or some people call it deformity. That's a no-go as well. And those are things that you know are, are kind of easy to put your put your hand around. Uh, Jessica kind of dove you know into the weeds a little bit more, which are really important. But for kind of the general population, if you're 80 and have back pain, you're not going to be a candidate for disc replacement. Sorry. Well, we talked about a lot of things about cervical and lumbar disc replacement, but what's next? You know, technology is always going to advance, so there will be the next, you know, greatest widget or the next better materials for disc replacement. But really, the important thing is that if you've got an experienced surgeon, number one, that knows when to do a fusion and knows when to do a disc replacement, and has the experience to kind of include more people in that kind of gray zone that is not the original tight group, um, that's, that's kind of where you need to go. And, you know, if you've been told that you need a fusion, um, then, then get an opinion from an arthroplasty surgeon or artificial disc surgeon. Again, not one that just does it, but says, okay, no, you're not right. It would be bad for you. You should do the fusion. But most of the time, as we said, you're going to be a candidate if you kind of fulfill those general criteria that we just talked about. What do you think, Jess? I think that um, there is probably going to be more of a marriage of navigation with inserting these devices um, with lots of experience. I think that our, our data shows that we do a good job. We have very happy patients. We have great outcomes. But I do think that as we're moving more towards, you know, robotics and, and navigation and trying to decrease the use of radiation in the OR, um, many of these cases are very radiation intense because we're taking a lot of x-rays to make sure that we're doing this perfectly, um, you know, and positioning this as it needs to be. I do think that there is a role for other ways of being able to navigate intraoperatively and that that will, you know, ex basically be explored through through disc replacement as well. I want to thank everybody for listening to the Spine Talk podcast and I want to thank my guests, Dr. Jessica Shellock and Dr. Scott Blumenthal. And remember one thing, if you've been told you need a fusion, make sure you come and get another opinion to see if you're a candidate for this wonderful new technology of cervical disc and lumbar disc replacement.